السلام علیکم آن بہاف آف یو ایس کاؤنسل ایٹ لاہور نیشنل ایگزامنیشن اینڈ ایویلویشن فاؤنڈیشن پنجاب ہائر ایجوکیشن کمیشن اینڈ ہائر ایجوکیشن ڈپارٹمنٹ پنجاب آئی ویلکم یو آل ٹو دس کیپیسٹی بلڈنگ انیشیٹو انڈر دی امبریل آف اسٹیپ دیٹ از اسمارٹ ٹیکنیکل ایجوکیشن پروگرام دس کیپیسٹی بلڈنگ انیشیٹو از کمپوز آف اے نمبر آف ویبینارز دیٹ ول بی فالوڈ بائی انٹریکٹو کوشچن اینڈ آنسر سیشن ایٹ اے لیٹر ڈیٹ وی ہوپ دیٹ یو فائنڈ دس ایکسرسائز ٹو بی پروڈکٹو انگیجنگ اینڈ بینیفیشیل آن آل اکاؤنٹس پلیز ڈو ناٹ فرگیٹ ٹو سینڈ اس یور فیڈ بیک اینڈ کوشچنس ایٹ دس ای میل لیٹس موو آن ٹو یور ویبینار فار دا ڈے Welcome to NEEF and the STEP training. This is Chaudhary Fazlil Mokeem, Chief Executive Officer, Aspire Training and Consulting Pakistan, Civil Service, 16 years in higher education and now training and consulting. It is a great honor to be addressing senior members of the Punjab government, uh, honorable principals and staff of the US Consulate. Uh, the um, a module allotted to me is named Team Building. Um, with some uh, authority at my level, I would like to rename it Leadership and Team Building. So, keeping in view the time constraint, uh, let us first hit leadership. If you look at the historical background to this concept, which is much used and also much abused, actually, um, I, I would suggest there's a core argument to it. And the core argument is, that leadership is nothing but a compatible movement betwixt task and consideration. Talking about Thoros Ordu Bolsago, what I'm trying to say is that a leader has to balance the tasks that he or she allocates and the consideration that he or she has for the employees. So as some slides will show you, um, my core argument is that it is between task and consideration that a leader has to move whether you are in the school administration college administration or corporate administration that i now deal with so from here where are we going the mood question would be how to define authoritative leadership i mean there could be many ways of defining it but it's pretty much top down it's pretty much intimidating and maybe to an extent it is adaptability, but it's pretty much top down. The leader knows what he says. <laughs> well, actually, he believes that he knows what he says. So it's pretty much top down. Uh, that, that is my punchline for authoritative leadership. But then what is affiliative? Affiliative is somewhat different from authoritative. Affiliative is somebody who would heal the wounds, actually. <laughs> who would take people along. So if you were looking at authoritative, you would find many examples. Look at a political example, Charles de Gaulle from France. Uh, if you wanted to look at affiliative leadership, look at Mr. Nelson Mandela from South Africa. Uh, if you wanted to then go into democratic leadership, obviously you could quote many examples. Um, for example, I think a very good example of democratic leadership would be Mr. Abraham Lincoln from the US, uh, who divided the nation and who built a team around his, 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 his movement to get the US together. And finally, finally, if you looked at a coach, I would present to you the world famous concept or the world famous framework of GROW, which says you set a goal, you look at the, the reality of yourself, you look at the opportunities around yourself, and then actually you put in the will part, you want to do something. So, if I was to kind of put in a tagline here, a brief tagline, because I do want to make sure that you get the basics of it. The brief tagline would be authoritative is top down. Affiliative is combining. Uh, democratic is bringing ideas, building a team. And finally, uh, the final part, the coach part is you actually tell your coachy, well, this is the way, <laughs> take this way. But you don't travel with the coachy, actually. You give him an outline of what he needs to do or she needs to do, and then you make him or her build on the outline. So a little bit, a little bit of a sprinkling uh, today on leadership, ladies and gentlemen. 
I, I think it's very important to, to understand that no concept is bad. <laughs> Authoritative, affiliative, democratic or a coaching style. I think all of these are valid. I think it's a continuum that you look at. So you're being authoritative at one point and then you're being affiliative yet at another point. You're being democratic and then actually at some point in time you're turning into a coach. So this much on leadership. I would now like ladies and gentlemen for you to turn your attention towards the second part of this, this summary that I'm trying to create for you. And the second part is what they call workplace management or, or, or work management frameworks. Now this is very interesting. If I was to link it to my dear country, Pakistan, uh, you'd be happy to know that we, what we called in schools and colleges and uh, in the corporate administration has suddenly become work management frameworks. We're looking at the whole organization and let me then give you three or four important things out of that so that you have an idea of what I'm saying about and please allow me to pick a piece of paper. I want to lose. What is the core? The core is does your organization have a strategy? This is not human resource management. This is an upgradation of administration. So for my honorable principles, you are leading a college and you have this BS program coming up. So what you're looking at work uh, place management or work management frameworks is you're looking at trying to mobilize the whole office around the strategy. So as Mintzberg would say, what is your strategy? I mean, as a principal or as a higher education person working for the government of Punjab, what do you do when you make strategy? Uh, Mintzberg would say, well, actually, uh, you do three things. You think a strategy and then probably you see a strategy and then you do it. But strategy is basically trying to align your office your workplace in terms of what you want to deliver to your client. So the next big thing is your client. And this wonderful thing yesterday, before I went into this recording, I had an excellent experience with a bank. <laughs> so this guy comes up and I ask him that I have to draw, you know, a bit of money. And he says, well, I don't have time. See? You can't do this to the client. Now your client could be a university where you're running this BS program or could be the children actually who are part of the BS program. But you have to understand that your client will stay with you, will come with you, will love you, and will actually refer you to other students if you build a trust in the relationship. The client has to know that you are there to serve. And that brings me to the third thing. And the third thing is performance. You must perform. You see, what, is, what good is a two-year degree, which is going to be a four-year degree at the end, if the child does not get a job. I mean, this is Pakistan. I mean, we are third world. We're a great country, but we're third world. We're trying to pick ourselves up. I mean, if, if, if we are thinking that we are going to, out of every hundred children that we train, we're going to have 90 entrepreneurs and 10 job seekers, I'm sorry, with all my experience of 30 years, I think you're dead wrong. You need to create more jobs and your degrees need to be aligned with your jobs. So what I'm trying to say and submit is, that you need to understand this work for a work management framework by saying you have the strategy, then you have performance, and then you have the client. And once again, I would ask Neef to provide you with, with my slides because they are more in detail so that you could look at them and so that you could, we could talk more about it when we actually have the Q&A session, whenever we have it. So that's two parts, the leadership part and the workplace management part, or if you don't want to call it the workplace management part, the work management framework. So you have strategy, once again, let me repeat it. You have strategy, you have performance, and you have client. You have to look at these three things and you have to align them. So that is the second part. The third part is my favorite because for the last uh, six years, if I may say, after 16 years in higher education in Pakistan, after doing all the brands that you could have in Indian Islamabad, by the grace of Almighty and with the prayers of my parents, I'm now into training and consulting. So if you want to lead, you need to have an excellent work force 
because you need to mobilize the workplace with the workforce. It is not the other way around, you know. In many universities that have worked for in Pakistan, I have great reverence. I'm not going to name anybody, but for the universities that I've worked in and also for the schools that I've seen, I always find that our workforce, the human resource available to us, is not really up to the mark. While the teacher is doing the magic in the classroom, we don't find, or I, I have not seen, the kind of backup support that the teacher would need. So, so coming to workforce, I think there are three concepts that I would like to present to you, only three, because we need to get into a summary here. The three concepts that I would like to present to you is, first of all, you need to understand what is the need of your organization. And for that, I bring to you, as the slide would show later, and also in my slides, uh, Jay Gilbert's model, and the model is on uh, on how to how to analyze your organization, the capabilities and the capacities of your organization, because that is how you need to move forward. So the first step in any training and development program is an organization and analysis that you have to do and that is important I think. A second step once that is done I think once you've looked at your organization and you know what is happening is to look and that's the difficult part is to look at what interventions do you need to plan for your people and for that the slideshow will tell you I have what I call the personal need analysis framework. So this personal need analysis framework tells you what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of your employees and that is a core issue in Pakistan. We are not very advanced, especially in the public sector and also I think in the education sector. We are not very advanced, we are getting there but we are not very advanced in terms of actually looking at the capabilities of our people. Actually, I am referring to the performance appraisal, I think we are still way short of the international standards. You look at the organization, carry out a need analysis, you look at the person, carry out a need analysis and then the favorite thing with all us teachers, then you make a lesson plan, then you roll out a program, then you assess them at the end of the program and finally what do you want to do? I mean what behavioral changes you want to have in the person that you have trained? When you want to get this person a gentleman or a lady, you want to get this person very ready, very ready actually, for delivery of what you have taught him. So I call this, and Kolb calls it actually, I don't call it, I've taken it from Kolb. Kolb calls it active experimentation, concrete experimentation. Look, you cannot run an organization only if you have great IT systems, you have great strategy, you have great supply chain, you have great resource, you can't do it. It is not possible unless at the front of this you have great rainmakers. I think that is absolutely critical. My, my very, very humble comment on what I've seen in the Pakistani universities is that there is too much of a control which lies with the administration of the school, college or the university. Look, it's very important. <laughs> Uh, please, I, I, I apologize in advance, but I think it's very important for the teacher to be allowed to go wild in the class. <laughs> if you don't allow the teacher that space in the class, he or she will not be able to make that magic. And that is the core of the BS degree, if I may say. If the student is motivated, and I'm going to talk about motivation later on. If the student is motivated and the teacher is absolutely on fire in terms of what he's teaching, obviously, <laughs> And that is where he's going or she's going to make the difference. So I think we need to understand this, that training and development is not going to get us anywhere unless we actually ready our people for the concrete delivery, concrete experiment, as Kolb says, of what you have taught them. So that takes care of training and development. So if I could do a small flashback. The flashback is simple. You need to have a choice of a leadership style you need to have an understanding of strategy, client and performance and you need to have a good sense of how to prepare people for the concrete experience and for that what you need to do I think is and that is very important for that what you need to do actually is to raise their level and for, for, for you to be able to raise their level of performance you need to motivate them but you also need I think it's very critical you need to look at your organization 
what are the problems there you need to look at the person what are the problems there address his performance appraisal and then you need to prepare a lesson plan and then you need to actually get the person ready so once again you know this might sound a bit theoretical but I, I, I'm not only aware of the fact that we have a time constraint but I'm also aware of the fact that I am going to give you bullet points here so that you could then build on it and ask me whatever questions that you want to ask me when we come to the later part of it. So these are, these are three parts uh, that I wanted to present to you and let me now take you to the fourth part which is I think extremely important, extremely important in as much as the 21st century is concerned. And what is the fourth part ladies and gentlemen? The fourth part obviously is diversity and inclusivity. <laughs> And these words sound very fashionable, but are they only fashionable? Are they not practical? If you looked at the corporate Pakistan, you would find diversity as being a big buzz issue. Companies are being judged on diversity. So, well, you have employees from what segments? And well, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, may God bless us, what is the ratio of women to men? what is the ratio of minorities and how many women are holding board positions similarly I, I think you could do a big study in not only in the Punjab but across Pakistan and see well actually how many principals of these great colleges that we have across Pakistan are female principals and how many of them are male and you would understand there's an argument at the top the top argument for diversity is do you have enough female principles across the country and then the core argu argument would be down below in teachers do you have a good ratio and then there would be a third part of the argument which would say well actually in the classroom what is the ratio of boys to girls I think diversity and inclusivity is, is extremely important when you get the slides and whenever you get them and when Neef provides you with these slides to actually help you understand what I'm saying excuse me, I think you will understand that diversity is the way forward. Now, one big reason why diversity is the way forward, especially for my respected principals and the people from higher education Punjab who are sitting through this session, I think one reason why diversity is very, very important, ladies and gentlemen, because you are dealing with the millennials. I have four of them in my home. I have trained 20,000 of them in different universities. So you have to understand that. You have to understand that that in order to be able to deal with the millennials, you have to have an understanding of what diversity is. So what diversity is ultimately is that you have to seek unity, not in unity, but you have to seek unity in diversity. And that is absolutely important. And that will mean actually you have to create a vision around your diverse workforce. You have to create a vision around <laughs> the diverse student body that you have and then you have to understand that there is actually within the student body a new generation the millennials uh, that much said about diversity and then once again I would appeal to you that you should look at the Deloitte model uh, that I will be presenting to you or that will be given to you by Neef on which I built my story uh, please look at the Deloitte model and then please come back to me in, 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 in the sessions uh, when we have our questions and answers but diversity is core. Well, why is diversity core? Let me repeat my argument. Diversity is core because at three levels at least, at the students' level, the girls in Pakistan are doing much, much better than the men. Girls in Pakistan are topping boards. Going wonderful, isn't it? That you, you, have, you, you have girls and female, young females going into the armed forces of Pakistan. So you have to understand this diversity at a level of the youth. Then there's diversity at the level of your teachers and then there's a diversity issue at the level of the principles that you might have and actually the universities that you're dealing with. So I think that's important. So having said that, once again, a quick flashback. Know your leadership style. Know whom you're training and developing. Seek diversity and harness diversity and actually build your workplace around the notion of excellent human resource and actually around the notion of having excellent products coming out of the BS degree. Many, many years ago in a university, somebody asked me, actually, Chaudhi Saab, who are our clients? And I said, well, our clients are the industry. 
and there was a huge debate on this. <laughs> and I said, well, our clients are the industry because our products are our students. And he said, no, 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 Joseph, you're wrong. Our clients are parents. I said, no, I'm sorry, I will never agree with you. <laughs> because ultimately, my argument is a core argument. But you are building a new Pakistan. I don't want to get into the politics of it. But I do want to get into the economics of it. And the economics of it is that you have to make sure that your student coming out of this BS degree is ready for the market. If you can't get him the job, you're nowhere. So let me move forward slowly and what is the issue then? What is the big issue when you're <laughs> dealing with your employees? Is the big issue training and development? Or is the big issue actually dealing with the people who are working with you, your teachers, your staffers, your admin staff, mm, uh, what have you, your, your non-gazetted staff as the government of Pakistan would call it. What is the issue? I think there's a big issue. And I think, I think, I think the, training, uh, the training designers have done a good thing uh, for bring, bringing in this community college framework, but also for pointing out that there's a staff in line issue. Well, the staff in line issue is simple. And once again, you'll get some slides. I brought some models for you uh, that will help you understand the staff and the line issue. So what is the staff issue? Well, the staff issue is around the principal, actually, with all due respect. The staff issue is not in the classroom. Uh, that's a problem. If you could refer back to my university's example, where I said that actually there's a big issue in terms of what the administration of a school, college, or a university wants from a teacher. And then there's a bigger issue of what the teacher wants to do in the classroom. So I think, I think the staff in line issue is very clear. <laughs> the staff issue originates from the principal's office, from the top team that the principal has. And the line issue actually originates in the classroom. With all due respect, with great regard for my principal friends and my, my, my senior colleagues here who would be watching this video, I think in a school college environment, the staff line issue has to be resolved by understanding, not by giving away. Please don't take it as if I was trying to get into your authority paradigm. I don't want to, but up from my 30 years of experience in the civil service, then my, my, my academia experience, and now my consulting experience with the corporate world, I can tell you that ultimately it is the line which is important. I'm not making an argument for disempowering uh, the, 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 the staff. No, no, no. But I'm trying to make an argument, you have to give the line, in this case, the classroom, enough empowerment. I would not want to kind of make a divisive argument because I am in an affiliative mood today. But I would like to place before you this, this notion that you cannot run a good academic program unless you cannot run a good academic program unless, unless, you have good curriculum. I, am, I will never say that you can run an academic program without a good curriculum. I think that's important. It's critical. <laughs> but you can also not run an academic program without letting the teacher be completely free and imaginative in the classroom. Uh, let me be a bit controversial because, well, why am I controversial? <laughs> if you ask me, if you ask about me in Pindian Islamabad, they'll tell you my reputation. I'm a good teacher, but I, I work my own way. But I want to tell you this, I think it's critically important that, I mean, you could tell a teacher 20% quizzes, 20% mid-exams, 30% final exams. Or you could actually tell the teacher 20% quizzes, so many quizzes, mid-exam, so many marks, so many questions, final exam, so many marks, so many questions. Please don't tie the teacher to an extent where he loses or she loses the imaginative capacity to bring forth a revolution in the class. It is very important for Pakistan. It is very, very important for Pakistan that we, that we create excellent research. We have to do it. There is no way out. But it is also very, very important for Pakistan that we create excellent and absolutely imaginative teachers. So the line and staff issue has always been through centuries and it is today and I think it will remain. But we have to understand, my, my, my entire idea of, of, of trying to present this to you is to make you understand for those 
the honorable people who are sitting in front of my camera. Well, I don't care about the time also, but I need to drive home this, 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 this argument here that you have to understand, the line has to understand that the staff will plan. It is their right to plan. And you must give them their right. The staff must understand that they have to plan in a very broad sense. <coughs> and they have to give the due respect to the line in the classroom. Unless you give the due respect to the line in the classroom, it will be very, very, very difficult for you to pre prepare students because that is Chaudhary Fazle Mukim's take on Pakistani education. Your client is your industry. Your client is not your parent, the child's parent. It is your industry actually. What sells in the industry is what you should produce in the BS program. Be very clear on this, ladies and gentlemen, as I actually put my entire 30 years before you and to tell you that your is your industry or your client is, well, if you wanted to talk broadly, your client is actually somebody who's going to offer a job. It could be another university, or it could be another school or college if you prepare a teacher. It's very important that you should understand this. So, so this much on the staff and line thing, the staff and line thing can be handled, provided it is a tight loose kind of an arrangement. The tight is here, we prepare the syllabus. We make the curriculum, but we come to you and we'll ask you. We'll keep the plan, the plan broad, and then it is the line guy who says, or the line lady who says, well, actually, please get out of my classroom. <laughs> this is my classroom. Let me do what I want to do. If you trust me, let me do it. I think too much of system, too much of restrictions is going to destroy the classroom. But that's my message on the staff line thing. So let me take you forward now. What will make your program go? What makes an army go? What makes an army grow, go? Hmm? What makes a civil service go? What makes the corporate go? What makes the army grow? What makes the civil service grow? What makes any organization grow? Is actually the issue of the rainmaker. But then may I ask you this polite question and I want you to ask this question to me when we do the Q&A. Who is the rainmaker? Are you clear of that? I'm not trying to make a political case here for, for teachers only. But who is the rainmaker? We are in the education environment. I have partially left it, I now train, I have my clients. But who is the rainmaker actually? <laughs> the rainmaker, in my opinion, is the gentleman or the lady. I will not use the word teacher is the gentleman or the lady who is doing service delivery. I think that is very important. My message to you is, as I come towards the end of what I'm saying to you, my message to you is, the rainmaker is the gentleman or the lady who does the service delivery. You make your own decision who does the service delivery. I, from, from, from this camera, cannot tell you. I do not wish to kind of, you know, be, by, be partisan. I would be bipartisan. So what to do with this gentleman or lady that he will deliver on what you want him or her to deliver on? You know, I am not going to talk to you about theories of motivation. I am going to talk to you about what makes the mayor go. And what makes the mayor go? Is it money? Your choice. A country where food inflation is around 30%, no political argument, logical economic argument. So what will make a mayor go? Money? Absolutely, good salary packages. But what will make the mayor actually canter? <laughs> but that's important. So what will make a mayor actually canter? Uh, excellent leadership that you are. I mean, you don't need to take these lessons from me, actually. <laughs> you are. You read about this and you'll get my primer and then you'll talk to me and then we'll talk, actually. But, so the mayor goes if you do something for the physical, and, uh, physical security and the safety of the mayor, right? <laughs> and when will the mayor canter? Well, the mayor is going to canter, actually, <laughs> if he or she or, you know, whatever the gender, the horse or the mayor feels actually that there's somebody who's taking care of him or her.
standing behind him or her. Every time there's a problem, he or she can look back. She will canter if you have great leadership. You will start trotting if you have some money with which you can feed your family, you can feel safe. And this is Maslow, isn't it? This is Maslow all around, isn't it? <laughs> this is Maslow. I don't want it. I didn't. I did not want to talk about Maslow because that would be very coming, coming, a very kind of a fundamental thing. But I want to say, say to you: so the mayor is going to go. It's going to trot if you give the mayor a good salary package. I, I do not wish to go into the good good salary package bit, but that is important. And the mayor is going to canter <laughs> if you actually give good and standard leadership taking care of your mayor and I tell you it's going to absolutely go into a wild gallop if you have any sense of what is happening in this world Allah bless you it's going to go into a wild gallop actually if you can actually align the superior leadership with the reward system and you can actually intrinsically tell the mayor this is your turf you are the line manager go and do it let me tell you, it will happen. So you have to motivate. Now once again, you get these theories, you know, and I, I don't want to go into the theories, but I think motivation is important. I think motivation is important because it will get you somewhere where you cannot get, even if you had the best performance management system, even if you had the best working place, even if you had very motivated people, otherwise who wanted to come for a 9 to 5 job. No, it has to be a 24 hour cycle and a 24 hour cycle Ladies and gentlemen, officers of the Punjab government and officers of the U.S. Consulate is only, only going to be possible if you motivate. So let me flash back and leave you with this thought. You need to have good leadership. You need to have a good workplace. You need to understand staff in line. You need to train and develop. And you need to motivate. And I present you at the end of this small talk. I have not kept a timer, but I think I've said enough. For you now to build upon this, to look at my slides, please. I would ask Neef to provide you with my slides. And then to also actually come back to me in the Q&A session so that we could talk more about it. There's no point in, you know, doing a 45 minute or 50 minute session. I think I've delivered on my targets. And I bless you. I bless Punjab. I bless Pakistan. For 56 years, I have lived in this country. My God, my God, I love this country. <laughs> I wish I could tell you someday how much do I love this country. And maybe, maybe, you know, when the COVID thing is over, we'll meet somewhere in some college and school and we'll talk a bit about it. Why to render these services to Pakistan? Particularly from the platform of NEF, I'm extremely grateful to the US Consulate who've done this great, wonderful initiative. And I hope that the Punjab government, you know, pushes it forward. But I do want to in the end, so is there a case example, uh, that, that this is the end, is there a case example that I want to leave you with? Well, yes, there is. I want you to look up Hugh Catchpole. I'm sending with the material a small video on Mr. Hugh Catchpole, born in RIMC, Royal Indian Military College, Dehradun, crossed over to Pakistan after 1947, built the great cadet college, Hasanabdal. From there, being the principal at cadet college, Hasanabdal, he went on and became the principal of Pakistan Air Force College Sargoda. Look at this, look at this man. And then after being principal at two different places, he led the English department at Abdabad Public School. I have not said something, ladies and gentlemen, which cannot be proved. I have said what is happening in Pakistan. What we need to do actually is, without creating a political argument, because I am completely apolitical when I am in the teacher's mode. What we need to do is to actually completely build a new road. As they say in agriculture, I'm also an agriculturist by profession. So as they say in agriculture, you need to have a farm to market road. You need to understand your students are your farm. Build on them. Build on this program. And you need to understand that their parents are very reward. Please don't get me wrong. I have children. I am because of somebody. The market is the job market, ladies and gentlemen. Pakistan will grow not only through entrepreneurship, but also when people will have jobs. So in the end, as I always say, 
I have this, well, I am a hopeless romantic, you know, people talk to me about my vision for Pakistan as a small time teacher. I have my YouTube channel, but I want to tell you, there is nothing more important, officers of the Punjab government, and actually my absolutely honorable principals, and the people of the US Council who are sitting here, please be reminded there is nothing more important than Pakistan. Pakistan, Zindabad!